passion for music began, according to my mother, when I was three and a half. And uh, there was a piano in our home in North Vancouver. And uh, I crawled up onto the bench and started plunking out the melody to Sesame Street. And so my mom decided at that point that they would enroll me in music lessons. He has searched the cosmos just for this. So So when I was 15, we were driving to Seattle to go shopping, as we very often did, and we were rear-ended on the highway. And um, I got, you know, I've had some whiplash and, and some pain in my right shoulder, and it traveled down my arm. And I was an aspiring classical pianist, and I, I didn't have the strength um, or the facility to play these high-level, you know, ARCT songs that I was, had been studying and learning and performing and competing with um, in my early teen years. And so, you know, I set out on this journey to heal my arm. I saw all sorts of specialists, neurologists, repetitive strain injury specialists, and I just wasn't able to recover. And so arguably the silver lining was that during that time frame, I was forced to begin exploring composition and singing as alternative ways of expressing myself because piano was sort of this lost love for at least for a, a stretch of time while I was really going through, um, you know, the thick of, of that injury. My passion for jazz coincides with, you know, that season um, where I was having to deal with my injured arm uh, because I, I didn't have the, the facility to really continue playing the, these ambitious classical pieces. And so um, at the time I was attending a high school where the, um, the jazz band director, uh, you know, he kind of scooped me up and said, do you want to play in the big band? And it wasn't even piano initially, he stuck me in the auxiliary percussion section. So I was playing the congas and the vibraphone. And that was my introduction to jazz. But he knew I played piano and he knew I was nursing this injury. So he started feeding me albums by Canadian um, jazz pianists like Rini Rosnes, who he had taught, you know, a couple of decades before I attended. Um, it was called Hansworth Secondary School. And, and, and this music slowly but surely captured my imagination. But it wasn't immediate um, because I was still grieving the dream that I had of becoming a classical pianist. So it was it was sort of a slow and steady climb towards a love of jazz. So I will never forget going to the Montreal Jazz Bistro, which no longer exists, but it was the main place along with the senator to go hear jazz in Toronto. And um, I went there, I was like probably 17, and heard this pianist, Jeff Kieser, playing solo piano. And, you know, m almost everybody in the audience was probably above 50, even above 60. And there I was, this young student, and he started playing songs by Bjork and Radiohead. And it just completely rocked my world. And so I began to seek out other contemporary jazz musicians who were exploring the nexus of pop and jazz. And then, lo and behold, CBC Records, when I was, you know, 25, approached me and said, we want you to put together a project that um, draws its repertoire from the great Canadian songbook, but not jazz tunes. We want you to go to Feist and Joni Mitchell and Bruce Coburn. They, they left it to me to choose the musicians whose work I was going to cover, but they, they had to give final approval. And the mandate was very specifically to use um, more mainstream songs and then to present them in a jazz context. And that was what really set me on this path of um, you know blending jazz and pop, which is what I ultimately became known for. So I grew up listening to classical music, but my sisters were, <laughs> were listening to Bono and U2 and uh, Janet Jackson and Michael Jackson. And, 
I had a love of R&B and hip hop and gospel music from an early age. And then when I was at Humber College, I discovered Bjork and I discovered Sting. And then finally, Joni Mitchell, whose music I didn't necessarily warm to immediately. But as I grew in my tastes um, and I think in my abilities as a, as a musician, I started to see that the remarkable brilliance um, and well-roundedness that, that Joni brought to the table. Not only was she, you know, a beautiful female singer, she was just an absolute force as a singer-songwriter. I have come in to lose a small guy Feel to be a cock and something Something's happening It's funny, I, I do see in life and in, in music people often drawing a line between the sacred and the secular and I just don't see them as too inextricably, uh, or I, I don't see them as two distinctive things that, that cannot be reconciled. I see them as inextricably intertwined. They are one and the same for me. And so um, without me even planning it, um, threads of what I'm processing as, a, as a, a woman of faith make their way into my music. Your mercy's a new On the wind when we pray. And when I'm covering the music of other, of other artists, I'm drawn towards songs that explore spirituality and ask questions of faith and don't always resolve them, like someone like Leonard Cohen or Joni Mitchell, who I think have explored many different realms within, um, you know, their spirituality. Um, you know, I, I, I enjoy that they are seeking. I believe we're all seeking, you know, even those who call themselves atheists. I think we're all seeking to understand <laughs> what is behind this thing called life and the world around us. And so, um, yeah, it's just inevitable that my perspective, my worldview would influence how I write and uh, the songs and lyrics that emerge. I did see the So House of Many Rooms had its inception over eight years ago. I had the great privilege of meeting John Franklin, who is the executive director for an organization called Imago, a charitable Christian arts organization that I feel under John's leadership prides itself on working with artists who are a little bit more subversive and not necessarily as obviously or overtly Christian in their message and in their approach to art. Um, he too is interested in the nexus of the sacred and the secular. And so um, he brought me onto their roster and I began fundraising and, uh, you know, to, to record this future project that I didn't even quite know, you know, I didn't quite know what it would look like and what that sound would be. And it really wasn't until I met and married and began working with my husband, Ben Whitman, that I found the right platform. Ben was the one who challenged me and said, don't worry about the fact that they're, they can't neatly fit in that jazz box. The jazz box is kind of being blasted out of even within the genre anyway. And, you know, trust that your listeners are going to go with you and, you know, really, um, the spirit of jazz is to, to constantly push the boundaries of what jazz means. So with Ben's encouragement, I decided I would do that, and I got to explore bigger production than I ever had. You know, I was writing for the Toronto Mass Choir, who I had always dreamed of working with. They were on my bucket list. And string orchestra, 15-piece string orchestra, and a six-piece horn section and all these incredible singers who I had met in New York City and working with Sting. Lisa Fisher is on the album. She's now quite famous because of her principal role in 20 Feet from Stardom. And Joe Laurie, who's touring regularly with Sting and is an incredible singer-songwriter herself, and um, a number of others. So this, it really has been the fulfillment of a dream. Girls and boys, the branches, one, two, three. 
I think as a musician and as a performer for the rest of my life, I cannot be attached to, you know, neither the praises of nor the criticism of man. I, I have to be an even keel, and that comes from a spiritual place. And I have to trust that these songs can be used to touch the right people. And that's in a way what I'm always trusting can and will happen. And I had never seen say that Lila Bielli is a child of God, first and foremost, a wife, a mother, and, you know, it can sound really grandiose, but a vessel. I want to be a vessel of love and light in this world, and that is what the phrase The Radiance Project is meant to capture and express. So, that's who I am. Oh, Closing the road.